Let us pray. Faithful God, as we gather around the gift of your word, quiet within us any voice but your own. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Amos, and it is a, rather a collection of some smaller texts throughout the book in order to give us sort of a sense and a feeling for Amos's overall message. Hear now God's holy word from the first chapter. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah, and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Carmel dries up. And from the second chapter, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, but they have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink wine bought with fines they imposed. And from chapter five, they hate the one who reproves in the gate and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate, Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I had the privilege of being up here in the connection service with you all last week as well as Ken was traveling across all of the services preaching and I was taken by Jermaine, the drummer's t-shirt. Does anyone else remember the shirt last Sunday that Jermaine was wearing? He was wearing a shirt that said, I am not for everyone. I automatically, I loved this shirt. I wanted to have that shirt, and I wondered if anyone would notice if I pulled out my phone to see if Amazon could have me that shirt by the next day during the rest of the worship service when I wasn't up here. But Ken, Ken preached an excellent sermon on Daniel, and so I didn't break out my phone, and that gave me a little room for pause. Space gave me pause, and in that pause, some doubt began to creep in. Some doubt that I couldn't pull off that shirt. My first thought was, Nicole, you're not that cool. You can't wear that shirt. 
<laughs> but I tell you what, that shirt, it has stuck with me all week long. It became like a mirror to me, a mirror that allowed me to look in and to see parts of myself that I had not paid much attention to recently. And it was while I was looking in that mirror of that shirt that the hard reality began to sink in for me. My inability to pull off that shirt actually had absolutely nothing to do with my cool factor, which has never been particularly high and it has never really been much of a concern of mine. But what I saw is the truth, the truth that I really have spent most of my life trying to be someone for everyone. When I was younger, I tried my best to please my parents along with teachers and any other person of any kind of authority. I tried to please them while also walking that very fine line so that I did not draw the attention of my peers to me and so that they would label me as being someone who was sucking up all of the time. As I got older, I honed what is a natural character trait into a skill that on the whole I am grateful for, and that is for the most part, I think, an asset in serving as a peacekeeper and a bridge builder. But this mirror disguised as an I'm not for everybody t-shirt that Jermaine wore last Sunday has had me considering this week if there are times when I am leaning into the peacekeeper bridge builder role and skill because it is what is good and healthy for the community, for myself and for those around me, or if it's because I simply am trying to please everyone all of the time, or at least not put people off. Now Amos, Amos could have pulled off this shirt. One doesn't say the things that Amos says if one cares or needs everyone to like you. Amos, a sheep breeder and a dresser of sycamore trees from the southern kingdom of Judah, goes and proclaims a message to the northern kingdom of Israel at a time where they were experiencing relative peace and prosperity that they needed to change their ways or face complete devastation. Amos didn't hold up a mirror for Israel to realize that the comfort and the wealth of the powerful has been gained because of their oppression of the poor. No, he didn't hold up a mirror. He shouted it from the megaphones. He used a sky rider and attached a banner to the MetLife blimp that kept flying over the city. A message that declared and said to them, life is good for you, comfortable, powerful, wealthy ones of Israel, because you are willing to sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. Amos preached and pointed out that the sin and the exploitation had reached such epic proportions and persisted for so long that God will bring punishment on the people to call them back. Yet the people continued. They continued accumulating wealth by stepping on the poor and the powerless. They did not turn back. So Amos declares the people of Israel have broken the covenant with God and that Israel will be destroyed as a result of their sin. Certain parts of the Bible can be difficult to read, can they not? I believe Amos is one of those books. It's one of those parts because within its pages, we are confronted with God's anger towards God's people. God has had enough. Though it's a false statement, it's texts like these, like what we see in Amos, that have some Christians say things like, the God of the Old Testament is an angry and a violent God. 
The God of the New Testament, well, that God, that is the loving and the compassionate God. But friends, this is a fallacy. It is not a true statement. And yet we can't ignore either Amos or the similarly difficult text that we find in some of the other prophets and other places of the Old Testament and New Testament, I might add. So a good rule for interpreting a particular scripture passage is to keep the whole of scripture in mind as we enter into this week, particularly for us as a community, reading these minor prophets. And if we keep the whole of the Old Testament in mind as we encounter specific, difficult, and individual texts, I think that we can see the following. One is God's anger is real. It is present in the pages of Scripture. Two, God's anger needs to be taken seriously. I don't believe that it is a faithful act of interpretation for us to simply discard those passages because of our discomfort. The third is is that God is slow to anger. This is not God's first automatic response to God's people. God is slow to anger. And four, this anger does not endure. God's anger does not last forever. It is not God's final word. Scholar Gary Herrian, writing on the wrath of God, says, despite its tragic necessity, anger is not depicted as an emotion God delights in. Instead, it grieves God to be angry, and God would prefer to avoid it altogether. There are words from the prophet Hosea, which as you read through the Bible, you will encounter this week. And the words that are in the prophet Hosea from the 11th chapter show the depth to which this is true, the depth to which it is true that God does not desire to be angry and the ways in which God would prefer to avoid the anger altogether. In Hosea, God cries out saying, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Will Wellman points out this week in some of the materials that he's putting out for our reflection on these books that Amos called out the hypocrisy of Israel's worship, charging that Israel loved their sanctuaries and rituals more than God. Amos holds the people of God accountable to their covenant with God and doesn't allow them to slide into superficial adherence to the law. The covenant must be at the core of who they are. It must be what guides their thoughts their decisions, and their actions at all times and in every place. Not just in the temple, in every place. Amos is clear that Israel has been seeking to hold on to the rights and the privileges that come with being God's people, God's chosen ones, without bearing and taking seriously the responsibility that comes with such an identity. Amos is clear, direct, and unwavering that carrying the identity of God's chosen one requires a moral responsibility and living according to God's will. Righteousness and justice are of primary concern to God, and thus righteousness and justice are an obligation which the people of God will be held accountable Amos is a difficult read for us today because Amos does hold up for us a mirror. And when we take the time to look into the mirror and to see what is reflected back, we may not be fully comfortable with what we see.
I hope that you are brave enough in the week ahead to look into the mirror of the minor prophets, including Amos. I hope that you are brave enough to acknowledge what you see, what you see about yourself, what you see about the church, what you see about this community that we call home, what you see about this nation in which we reside, what you see about the world. Righteousness and justice are of primary concern to God, and therefore they are a moral obligation for us, individually and collectively, as the church, as communities, as a nation, as a world. What does God see as God looks at the world today? Amos is a difficult read because it's not quick towards words of hope or restoration, nor is Amos plentiful with these words. So be forewarned. <laughs> While Amos spends much more time trying to get across the message that God's anger is real and God's anger needs to be taken seriously, he also does acknowledge that God's anger does not endure. In Amos 9, we get a picture of this restoration in these words. On that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps and the treader of grapes the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and, that, and they shall be, rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Friends, God is for all people. For this reason, God entered the world fully human and fully divine in the person of Jesus, who is the Christ, in order that we might fully know how we are to live into the vision that God has for the world. A vision where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream so that peace and prosperity can be experienced by all God's people. May all glory, honor, and praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.